All right, well, since you guys are on time, we'll go ahead and get started. And then we'll, people come in late, we'll say they missed like the awesome stuff. <laughs> I'm just curious, who here is already a PM? And who like wants to become a PM? Okay, good. All right, cool. Great. Uh, well, welcome. Thanks for coming to my talk. Thanks for voting for it. I appreciate it. Um, stop working. Um, cool. So, if uh, you know, I talk a lot about product market fit. Stop working on it. Oh, it froze up. Of course it did. So if you've seen my other talk, there we go. Um, you know, a lot of my stuff is about how to achieve product market fit. And at one point in my career, I realized, you know, actually when I did my own startup, I practiced what I preached, and I did like uh, 80 101 user tests before we like launched. And you know, someone would say, oh, what are you working on? I'm like, oh, I'm doing this product. We're in private beta. I'm like, hey, can I check it out? Like, sure, come do a 101 user test. And you know, I'm, I think I'm pretty good at PM and UX design, but we got a lot of feedback from the first 15 sessions, like usability issues and messaging issues. But a lot of it was messaging. It wasn't the feature set or the UX. It was just how we were talking about the product. That made me realize, geez, you can have the right feature set, the right UX design, but messaging really matters. So I started to put together a talk uh, on how to craft winning messaging, you know, also like how to achieve messaging market fit, basically. For those of you that haven't um, learned about my background yet today, I started out with an engineering background. Um, I moved out here a while ago to go to business school at Stanford. That's where I learned about product management as a career. I said, that's what I want to do. Uh, since I hadn't done it before, I asked everybody, where's the best place to learn? They said, into it. And I went to into it for five years, and it was a great place to learn product management. Um, shortly into my career as a PM, I realized UX design is super important, so I've made it a point to learn a lot about that. I'm actually giving a talk next session on UX design. Um, and then after into it, I was a product leader at different startups. I wanted to do my own startup, so I did that for four years. But for nine years now, I've been helping companies uh, with product management, basically as a product management consultant. Um, I'm also big in sharing best practices. So I, for four years now, I've been running a monthly speaker series. Uh, it's in Mountain View at Intuit, called Lean Product, Lean UX, Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, so I invite you guys to check that out. My Twitter handle is at Dan Olson. That's how you can win a book. I'm going to give a copy of my book away. And I put all my slides and videos at my website, dan-olson.com. So they will, they're already up there. Actually, this talk. I think it's up there. It's not off listed up there. But um, I wanted to share an example of when, you know, as a PM, we were trying to achieve um, the right product, basically. And we talked to customers, and this is what they told us what they wanted, basically. And this is how the PM envisioned the product. Uh, this is the alpha version, so we had some issues, but we fixed them with the beta. <laughs> we no longer had issues. This is what marketing was advertising. Uh, this is what was actually ready by the original launch date. <laughs> What we thought. This is what the press had to say about it, and this is what the customer really wanted. So, just a funny cartoon to show, like, whether it's messaging or or your product, how like trying to play this game of figuring out what's going to resonate with customers and figuring it out, uh, things can go wrong basically. <clears throat> so, um, for those of you familiar with my work, that you know that basically the, my main framework is a product market fit pyramid. Um, which starts out with the target customer and the underserved needs as the market, right? And it, each layer builds on the next layer. Um, and you don't target the market. You target, you don't control the market. You target who you want to go after. But you make all your decisions up here, value prop, feature set, UX design. Messaging basically kind of lives like as part of UX design in my mind, right? Because when you do the UX, it's got words there, right? You have to use words to convey whatever you want to users. So just to kind of fit it into that framework. Um, and there's not a lot of good guidance out there on product market fit or messaging market fit, so that's why I wrote the book, The Lean Product Fit Book. Um, like I said, I'm going to give one away on Twitter. Um, I gave one away from this morning. I have to give another one away. But the way to do it is just include a tweet with my handle on it, and I'll go through the tweets and at the break or at the end of the day and uh, give it out, and then just come find me. And you know, if there's a slide that you like, take a photo of it. That's great. Uh, the, the hashtag is SVP Camp for our event. That's the product management hashtag. So. Um, so, all right, cool. So let's get into it. What is product messaging market fit? So, you know, Lean Startup made the concept of product market fit very, very popular. It actually was coined by Mark Andreessen in 2007, and Lean Startup made it, you know, much more uh, well-known concept. It's basically making sure that, like, customers like your product, right, that, 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 that there's a fit with that. Um, and as I mentioned, though, messaging, you can view as a distinct component. Like, you may have the right feature set or functionality, but the way you're talking about it doesn't resonate with people. So you can have the right features but the wrong message. And so that's what I mean by messaging market fit. It's making sure that 
the way you're talking about your product, uh, the messaging you're using resonates with customers. Um, and for me, I, I, can, I, I view that I can, you can decompose different elements of the customer experience into, I think there's these three ones you can decompose, functionality, UX design, and messaging, right? So functionality is just like what it does, right? So you could have a search engine, say, with the, but you could have a completely different UX design, right? You could have the same backend algorithms, but different UX design. Similarly, you could have different messaging for similar products, and it would be different. So these are like three different kind of unique aspects. And I think a lot of times as PMs and devs, we focus on functionality. Designers, you know, obviously focus on UX design. I think PMs should know enough about UX design to be dangerous. I don't expect you to be the world's best designer, but to be able to critique and, and add value. And then I think messaging is the third, is just overlooked. It's very rare to have someone in a company who's got that skill set. So it will inevitably fall on someone else to write the messaging. So um, like I like to say a lot of times, good PMs fill vacuums. If there's no, if there's not a good messaging or product marketing person, on your team, then you may have to like write this, some of the copy or something. So this this uh, this class today hopefully will help you with that. And the context I like to see is if you look through these three three lenses, you know I just got done talking about analytics and how you have prospects coming to your website. When prospective customers come to your website or your app store page, what do they see first? What is it that they see first? Let's take an Evernote. This is the Evernote homepage. So you know someone says, hey Evernote's awesome. You can go check it out. You should check it out. Type in a Google Evernote. I end up at their homepage. This is what I see. Am I interacting with any of their features yet? I'm not using any of their functionality or features yet. They can tell me about it, but I'm not using it. Am I interacting with the design of their product, the UX design that they work so hard with their product? No. I'm interacting with the messaging first. So that's the first impression that people see is actually messaging, right? Because people have to get convinced to become customers before they use your product, right? So it's interesting, like, you know, basically they actually if you, we reverse engineer this, they have an overall tagline, remember everything, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good summary. And then they support it with three bullet points, capture anything, access anywhere, find things fast. So it's good, they've kept it short. There's a little bit of structure there. It's memorable, I, I can kind of quickly understand what it is without, and again, I haven't used any features of functionality. Not everybody out there is as good as Evernote at summarizing and communicating their messages to you. This is a different page for an Acer laptop it's C710-2055. Doesn't that make you just want to jump up and buy that? Yes. Can't you tell what it's going to do for you? Don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry, it's the NU.SH7AA.008. That makes everything clear, right? It's like, really? Like, how does this get out the door? How does somebody do this, right? And I know why. It's because they're so, they're a very tech-centric company, probably. And they're all, they're, they're about making the, you know, the best, cheapest, whatever, price point laptops. And so messaging is a complete afterthought and no one's paying attention to it. So you end up with this kind of stuff, right? And this is a really bad example, but there are a whole spectrum between Evernote and these guys, uh, and there's ways to get better. So the key, the key philosophy or technique is to market benefits, not features. That's what we want to do, right? Most companies focus on features. I talked about problem space, solution space in my morning talk. Um, we all live in the solution space, right? We're engineers, we're trying to out, you know, outbuild other people, out, come up with better features. So everyone's in feature land, you know, and um, it, that's just where people tend to be. But I think good PMs can help the team get to thinking about customer benefits more. Obviously, we need to build features at the end of the day. We want to make sure that they're focused on benefits. The, the other quote related to this is, is a famous quote where it says, hey, people don't want a quarter-inch drill, they want a quarter-inch hole. Right? A drill is a solution. The whole reason they want it is they need a hole. So that's the whole problem versus solution. And when you're talking about features, again, it's natural. Um, you're talking with your you know, developers during your sprint. You're going to be talking about features to them, right? But then what happens is people take that same language, and then that's what they slap on their release notes or on their web page or whatever. There's not a separate step of what does this mean to people, right? So here's some examples from big companies, right? Intel, third generation Intel Core, or five, core i5 processor. What does that tell you as a consumer, right? doesn't really tell you much. In fact, I have to go look up, so what generation are they on? Are they on fourth or fifth? Is that old or new? I don't know. <laughs> what does i5 mean? Is that the good one or is the seven, i3? You don't know, right? Netgear, N300 wireless router. How is it any better or different than any other wireless router? Is the N300 good or bad? I don't know. Even the cars, Infinity JX35. But don't worry, they rebranded the QX60 now. It's called the QX60. <laughs> like what? Like what is that supposed to mean, right? Acer, and we talked about the Acer, right? So this happens all the time. If you look through this lens, you'll see there's all these products that are named. They're just named poorly. They, have, they don't. 
they miss, if nothing else, they miss the opportunity to try to convey some benefit to you of what it would do for you. Right. That's why I think like, well, we'll talk about like PayPal. It's a great name. Hey, PayPal, pay your friends. That makes sense, right? Facebook, okay. Um, and one of the techniques that can help with this, so actually Amazon does, Amazon is famous for this. Jeff Bezos, basically, they make, they have a quote, we start with the customer work backwards. They make everybody, before they approve any project, write the press release. So they start with the messaging. It's like, what do we want to be able to tell the market and tell customers? Before we go and do any engineering or development or design, what is it we want to be able to claim and set, right? And so it's not, a, it's not, a, it's just, not, it's not just a, good, a glorified name for a PRD. It's, it's totally different. You have to keep it short. And, and they use, they, they, he says you need to use Oprah speak. You can't use any technically gobbledygook terms. You have to use like something that you know, someone watching the Oprah show would know, right? And so there's a very, is a format that they follow. It has nine elements, so it is, it's got a lot of stuff, but each one is clear. So it starts out with a heading, <coughs> name the product in a way the reader will understand. Not those names that we just said. A subheading, you know, who, who's the market for it and what benefit will they get? So it's just one sentence. You can see he's limiting it to one sentence. Summary, right? Um, the problem, the solution, the quote, the quote from the Amazon person, um, how to get started. They really think about that's kind of like the whole product thing that, that we're talking about this morning, how to get started. What would a customer say at the end of the day? Well, why would, what would the words that they would use to express this? And then closing and call to action, right? So that's how they do it, right? But I think it's a great way to, to, to just approach with that. What are we trying to claim? Um, I have a little study here. It's a little older, but basically the difference between how BlackBerry mentions or uh, mark messages or phones and how iPhone does. Let's look at this, right? This is a real language that I took. So this is a BlackBerry Torch 9800. This is what they said. With a 5 megapixel camera with flash, continuous autofocus, image stabilization, 11 photo modes, video recording, it's easy to capture a spontaneous moment. Let's look through this lens of features and benefits, like word by word analyze the sentence that we've got. Which words describe features? Five megapixels of feature, yeah. Autofocus. Autofocus. Stabilization. Right. There's a lot, right? Which ones describe benefits? Yeah, it pretty much only easy to capture those spontaneous moments. Let's color code it. So red is the feature stuff. Looks bad. Try to avoid that. And green is the benefit stuff, right? And we can actually give them a score. We can just count them up. They had six features and one benefit. Does that make sense? So they are six to one, like one seventh benefits, six sevenths feature speak, solution speak, gobbledygook stuff. Does that make sense? Now let's look at iPhone 4 for Apple. Um, same thing. Which are the words or features? Which ones are benefits? What's the benefits here? Yeah, see how they're like telling you what you're going to get out of this, not just telling you what the ingredients are, what the features are, right? So we can color code these as well, right? So five mega, they said five megapixel as well, but they have more greens, they have more features. In fact, if we score these guys, they have four benefits and four features, so a one to one ratio, right? And it actually makes sense. They basically use the feature to back up the benefit. So the feature is kind of like giving you the why, like, oh, well, how is it going to be? How are you going to do a better job capturing pictures in the light? Oh, because you've got an advanced backside illumination sensor, I see. That's called a reason to believe. So they did that on purpose. So one-to-one -one ratio versus a six-to-one ratio. That's a much better job of messaging. It's okay to mention features, but make sure you're covering the benefits. Why does this matter to the person, right? And so, you know, again, we want to start talking about customer needs and benefits. I talked about this. I'm going to cover this again real quick in the other talks, but problem space versus solution space, right? So, again, we live in the solution space. When we talk about features, we're talking in the solution space. And product teams live there, and we all live in the solution space, so it makes sense. But a problem, basically, is a customer problem, a customer need, or a benefit that the product should address. Right? So this is where you're trying to get keys apart what's the benefit versus what's the solution, right? A well-written product requirement, a well-written agile user story, like add the blank, I want a blank so I can blank. That's in the problem space. That's benefit, <coughs> right? In contrast, solution space is a specific implementation or feature to address the customer need or requirement, right? So... Um, that's the difference. And again, everyone that everyone just kind of rushes into solution space and doesn't take the time a lot of times to think about problem space. The example that I like to use to illustrate this is um, basically in, is when NASA was going to send astronauts into space, they knew the ballpoint pens that we use here wouldn't work because they need gravity. And it wasn't NASA. Um, it was actually one of their contractors, the Fisher, the head of the Fisher company, said, "You know what? 
I think we I can invent a pen that will write mistakes. And if you Google this, showing up on some urban legend thing, it's it's like it, saying, oh, did NASA pay the money? NASA didn't pay the money. This guy, NASA didn't ask him to do it. They just did it. But he spent a million dollars of R and D money, and he actually invented a space pen. You can buy a space pen. It writes in space, right? Faced with the same challenge, the Russians gave their astronauts pencils. You can actually get a Russian space pen. It's just a pencil in a box, poking fun at this whole thing. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, obviously, if these are both equally good solutions to the problem, right, of being able to write in space, then the one that didn't take a million dollars on the time and effort is better and a higher ROI, right? That's the obvious thing. The second thing is, even when you're trying to stay in the problem space, it's easy to get some pollution in there and have some solution artifacts in there. I call it solution pollution. So when the guy said, hey, I think I can invent a pen that writes in space, he had some solution pollution in that, in his problem statement. What was the pollution that he had? Pen. Yeah, he baked the solution into the problem. So of course you're going to invent a pen if you say a pen that writes in space, right? It would have been better if he'd been more vague and just said a way to write in space. That would have stayed closer to the problem space. And we can do even better than that. You can, you can use the five whys technique and say, well, why, why, why? So why do astronauts need to write in space? Like why? Capture yeah, to data. capture information and refer to it later. That would be an even better way to articulate the requirement, right? And that doesn't have anything to do with writing. Maybe we come up with some crazy Siri thing that you talk to and it reads back. So it opens up other solution opportunities, basically, right? So anyway, the way this plays out in our feature teams is your JIRA ticket says add a drop down, add this field, add this configurator, add this wizard. Drop down, wizard, field. Are those solutions or are they problems? They're solutions, right? So if you see that, you can say, why? Well, why do you want to add the drop-down? Oh, OK, well, I want to add the drop-down because we need to give the customer a way to specify the shipping address. OK, well, maybe let's say that as a requirement. And maybe a drop-down is the best way, maybe it's not. So whether you're trying to build a product or you're trying to do good messaging on a product, it all starts with the problem space and what the customer needs that we're trying to do. Let me illustrate uh, another example that's closer to software. Um, again, we've got problem space on the left, solution space on the right. I used to work at Intuit on Quicken. Uh, another one of our big products is TurboTax. Anyone using TurboTax? about this time of year. It's about that time of year, isn't it? Yeah. So it's a software product, so it's in the solution space. It competes with another software product tax cut. It's also in the solution space, right? Um, for those of you, what we want to do is kind of try to map between the problem and the solution. For those of you who use TurboTax, what value does it give you? What benefits? Why do you use it? Convenience. What else? Other people. Yeah. It's easy to use. Easy all to in, use. All in one. All in one. Cheap. Cheap. Yeah. Very fast, yeah. Import data from last year. Import data from last year, yeah. Make sure I don't miss anything. Make sure you don't miss anything. Well, they help you navigate which form. Help you navigate which form. Additional features are available at, at you know, at cost. Additional features if you need them, yeah. So everything you guys just brought up, that was good. That's all problem space stuff. And let's say I'm the PM for TurboTax. I gotta make sense of all that stuff. Did you all give me the same answer? I got a range of a lot of different answers. Too hard to make sense of that. Let's just design and build something and ship it. How about that? <laughs> That's what happens, right? Basically what happens. These people just go with their gut or they go with what they think, right? So it's hard. So that's the thing about the problem space is it's messy and it's fuzzy because people aren't computers. You guys, some people care about the convenience. Someone else covers, cares about cheaper. Someone else cares about, you know, uh, tells me which form to use, right? So how do we make sense of that? That's what I call defining the problem space. And that's, frankly, the number one job of PMs is that, right? We don't design the thing. We don't build the thing. Our job is to make sure we understand who the customer is and what the needs are and how we're going to be better, right? So anyway, um, we, if we're going to have some high-level benefit, it'd be something like, hey, it helps me do my taxes or helps me prepare my taxes. And you guys brought up a lot more specific things, which are good. So this is, I, I use the analogy of an onion that we want to peel. That's the highest level of the onion, the outer layer, so we know what category we're talking about, what context we're talking about, but we want to get much more details. The other person to help me appreciate this difference between problem space and solution space was Scott Cook, the founder of Intuit. And when he would be speaking to a group of product managers like this, he'd love at the end to kind of go, who's the biggest competitor to TurboTax? And we'd all raise our hand and hope he picked us. And when he picked you, you'd go, tax cut. He's like, no, you're wrong. It's pen and paper, because more <laughs> Americans we're using, using pen and paper to do the taxes, right? So that's the other thing about the problem space. It helps you really understand what are the true substitutes and competitors for how, you're, how people are getting those needs met, right? So that's the, that, that, that's, that's the other thing about the problem space. So again, what you want to do in, as a PM on the product side, which will also lead into messaging, is start in the problem space. Don't start with features. Don't start with space. Start in the problem space. And this is actually the fun part where you can say, okay, 
My team's goal is to help people with their taxes, or my startup's goal, or my company's goal is to help people with taxes. Let's do divergent thinking, let's do brainstorming, let's suspend disbelief and judgment for a little bit and brainstorm what are all the different ways we can help people when it comes to taxes. And your goal is to come up with all the crazy ideas and explore the problem space as much as you can. We're not saying we're going to do all these things um, or that they're good ideas. Again, it's brainstorming rules. So we're going to explore the problem space though. So we might come up with things like, hey, it can help me check my taxes. Right? Computers are good at math compared to doing it by hand. Um, it can help me file my taxes instead of having to go to the post office and stand in line and just push a button. It can help me maximize my deductions by asking me questions and you know, saying, you know, finding things that I could write off that I didn't know about. It can help me maybe analyze my return and see what my audit risk is and say, hey, you might want to reconsider this. These are just four detailed examples. The goal is to come up with as many of those as you can, basically. And you guys did a great job uh, as customers bringing up a lot of those. The other thing you'll notice is I think a, a well-written problem statement follows a certain pattern. You'll see a pattern here. They all start with a verb, right? Because it's actually doing something to provide value to the user. Check, file, maximize, reduce. The other thing is it's written from the customer's perspective, like my taxes, my deductions, my risk, right? As opposed to it written from the company or product perspective. So it's kind of like a, a well-written agile user story, right? Um, and then what you'll find, you know, how am I supposed to make sense of everything that you said is that people could be talking about fundamentally different benefits, right? People could be talking about the same benefit, but different levels of specificity. Someone could be very, very, someone said like it imports data from last year, that's very specific. Someone else is like, hey, it makes my life easy. It could be at a high level, right? And then finally, even if it's the same level, you probably could just be using different words. You guys aren't robots. You're not going to use the exact same ASCII string to describe what the benefit is, right? And so the way to think about it is there's these ladders. For each of these benefits, there's a benefit ladder, right? And so somebody said, let's do this. So like, like you said, you like how it imports last year's data. Why is that valuable to you? It saves time. It saves time, right? And why is that valuable to you? It's, it's time I could do something else. Yeah, right. So, so just you know, simple ask why. It's okay, it saves time, right? So here's an example. Like, you know, I may talk to a user and say, hey, why do you like Quicken? Well, it lets me see all my accounts in one place. Well, why is that valuable? Well, it lets me see how much money I have instead of having to go and getting all these figures and putting them in a spreadsheet. Okay, and why is that valuable? Well, it's faster than if I had to go track it down myself. Why is that valuable? It means less time managing my, my finances, save time, same kind of thing, right? So what we want to do is a similar thing to make sense of, those, of what the benefit ladders are, right? And for TurboTax, it ends up being um, confidence or empowerment. Like, hey, with the old way, I just didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't feel comfortable, but TurboTax just guides me and tells me which forms to fill out, and I feel more comfortable. Saving time, save time preparing taxes, save time filing taxes. And finally, save money by identifying write-offs and things like that, right? And being cheaper than a CPA and things like that. So once you get clear on those benefits, uh, we basically, um, I don't have time to cover it now, we want to use importance versus satisfaction framework to figure out which ones are underserved. And then we get into the Kano model to get clear on our value prop. Because one thing to understand what the benefits are that we want to deliver, the next level is how are we going to be better or different than the other people that are trying to deliver those benefits to customers. And that's where the Kano model comes in. Who, who's heard of the Kano model before? Cool. So you hear about it more and more, it's being applied to product management. I studied it actually before I even came out here in industrial engineering, and I've applied it. Uh, it also talks about user needs and satisfaction. I just want to explain the model real quick. On the horizontal axis, it's how fully does the product meet the need that we're talking about, whether it's save time or save money or convenience. You know, if we ask people, hey, how fully does it, on a scale of 1 to 10, how good a job does TurboTax do on saving you money, we'd get a score and we'd plot it there, right? The next thing is, how satisfied are you based on how much the product meets that particular need, right? So um, based on how much it needs, you can either be very dissatisfied or very satisfied. Now, if this seems a little complicated, the cool thing about the Kano model is it breaks everything down into one of three categories of benefits or features. The first is performance benefit or feature. This is pretty simple. More is better, less is worse. The more the product meets this need, the more customer satisfaction is generated. The less it meets the need, the less satisfaction generated, right? Say we're in the microprocessor chip business and our chip was 15% faster. We'd be outperforming our competition by 15% and making people that much happier, right? Um, let's talk about cars. Um, let's talk about cars. So say I was shopping for a car and there were two cars, they were pretty similar and the specs were pretty similar, but then I suddenly realized that one car has twice the miles per gallon as the other car. All other things being equal, I'd buy that car because fuel efficiency is a performance benefit for most people. The second category is must-haves. So having a must-have doesn't make anybody happy. But not having a must-have makes people unsatisfied. Right? You can't actually make people happy with these. Sticking with cars, 
say I was shopping for a new car, I went to the store, into the showroom, there's a car, I just love the way it looked. And I looked at the spec sheet, and I looked at the specs, and it looked great. But then I peeked inside, and it didn't have any seat belts. <laughs> I wouldn't buy it, because I'd be afraid of getting hurt or dying, right? But if car A has five seat belts, and car B has 100 seat belts, I don't see it 20 times better, right? Once I have one seat belt per person, it flattens out. And the third category is delighters or wow features, right? So not having it doesn't cause a problem because people aren't expecting them to be there. But if you have them, they can create a lot of positive satisfaction. Again, sticking with cars, <clears throat> um, not today, but back in the day. Yeah? Is there anybody yeah. Uh, get these slides? Yeah, they're on danolson.com. Yeah, dan-olson.com. They're on my website, yeah. dan-olson.com. Yeah. Um, and uh, the first cars that had GPS navigation, not today, but the first ones, it was a delighter. Before that, people were getting lost or printing out directions, and then all of a sudden you have GPS, you put it in, it changes how you get from point A to point B. But as we know, over time, more and more cars got GPS navigation. TomTom Tom and Garmin came out with their things, and now we all just use our phones. So this isn't a static picture, right? Things migrate over time, so that yesterday's delighters become today's performance features, become tomorrow's must-haves. And the pace with which that happens just depends on the level of competition and innovation in your space. But what we want to do is get use these three categories to categorize the benefits we're going after to get clear on how we're going to be better or different. And it's really important to look at this through the lens of a particular customer. Again, I use this peeling the onion uh, analogy a lot, um, whether it's talking about the problem space or the customer. A lot of times in product management, I feel like we get some, we stay at the outer layer of the onion, you get some superficial answer that sounds good, it sounds plausible and it sounds good, but it doesn't really provide the richness and detail you need to really get the product market fit. I remember I was, um, I was judging a competition at Stanford Design School, and I was just going around, and the first question I asked each team is, who's your target customer? And one team said, millennials. And I'm like, okay, that sounds good. So on the surface, it sounds good. It's like, okay, cool, they have a good sense. It's something specific. They had a quick answer. But then I thought about it. I'm like, how many millennials are out there? There's like millions of millennials out there. So on the one hand, it sounds specific, but when you really think about it, it's not that specific. And their product had to do with like preparing food at home, like a blue apron. So it would have been super easy to say, our product is for millennials who want to cook at home. That would be a better refinement of peeling the onion one more layer, right? But, and this is what happens all the time, whether it's a benefit or a customer, we stay at the high level. So I want to illustrate an example why it's so important to think about the benefits through the lens of a particular customer. Let's talk about a need that a lot of people have, the need for transportation within 100 miles of your home, right? To get to work, to get to school, whatever it is, to get around, right? That's a need that a lot of people have. That's the outer layer of the onion, if we're going to address that need. But I want to show how when you look through that need through the lens of specific people, the detailed needs are different, and therefore product market fit is different. Let's say on the one hand, we're going to talk to soccer moms. They obviously have the need to get around. And on the other hand, speed demons. They have the need to get around, right? Now, say I did 20 d discovery interviews with soccer moms. I said, hey, tell me what's important when it comes to transportation. I might hear things like, well, I'm carrying my children and their friends and all their sports gear, so the car's got to be big enough to hold all that stuff. I'm driving my children around. They're the most important thing in the world to me, so I'm really thinking about safety of the vehicle. And I'm doing a lot of driving on the weekend, so it would be great if I could save some money on gas, fuel economy, right? Those might be some things that we would get used to. If we talked to 20 speed demons and interviewed them, they probably wouldn't bring any of those things up. they bring up things like, well, it's important that the car go really fast, it's important that it looks cool, and that I look cool driving it down the street. And you end up with very different products as a result, right? And, and that's the thing about the car industry, is think about all the different shapes and sizes of cars that are out there, from minivans, to SUVs, to Coopers, to Scions, to whatever. They have a, right? They've done a really good job of not staying at the high level, but feeling the onion and understanding the details, right? So when we talk about whether it's your product or your messaging, you want to get clear on the details for your particular target customer that you're going through. And we want to use the Kano model basically to get clear on the value prop. Which benefits, out of all the ones that we brainstormed, which ones are we going to say, we're going to tell people, our product is this for you, right? And how are we going to, and more importantly, how are we going to be, make sure that we're better than the competition in how we meet those benefits? And so what we do to put the Kano model to use is we create a table. I've kept it generic here, but the idea is you list one per row, what are the must-have benefits for our category? What are the performance benefits for our category? What are the delighter benefits for our category, right? So I've kept it generic, um, and we'll, we'll go through this. When we go through the example, you'll see a, a real illustration of it. That's step one. Step two, create columns for each of your key competitors and one column for your product, right? You don't want to have 20 competitors, but you know, three to six key competitors, two to six key competitors is fine. And a, product for your, a column for your product. Then you want to score your competitors, right? Um, and you know, if it's something quantitative like chip speed, then sure, put numbers in there. 12 gigahertz, 15 gigahertz, that's fine. If it can be numerical, go for it. But it's also perfectly fine to just use high, medium, low, just to know where you stand, right? So in this case, both of our competitors have the must-have. 
the competitor A is the best at performance benefit one, so they're outperforming the top performer there. These guys are the top performer at this one. They're both so-so uh, on this benefit, and these guys have a delighter. This is the backdrop upon which we want to like figure out how we're going to be better or different. Right? This is the essence of product strategy. Right? And it might be tempting to be like, hi, 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 we're going to be high at everything and beat everybody on everything. That's not realistic. One, we probably don't have the resources to do it. And two, it's really not a focus. It wouldn't be focusing the efforts of our team or have a clear positioning out there, right? One of my favorite definitions of strategy is it means saying no. It means saying no to something. Like that's what strategic means. If you can just change your mind the next day, it wasn't a strategic decision. Right? So given this backdrop, we might go with something like this. Of course, we're going to have the must-have because we have to. Um, we're going to, you know, we're we're going to devote some resources to being medium on this benefit. We're not going to try to beat these guys, but we're going to we're going to, you know, be better than these guys. Performance benefit two, that's where we're going to say no. We're not going to really worry about that one. Uh, where we're going to try to be the best is performance benefit three, right? These guys are medium. We're going to be high. Maybe we've identified a target market segment that really values that, or maybe we've, um, maybe we've uh, got some ideas on how we can deliver a better solution that's going to deliver higher satisfaction. And then we have our own idea for a delighter. What matters the most when you do this exercise is what's called your unique differentiators, and that matters for your product and your messaging, which is what are the performance benefit where we're going to be the best, we're saying we're the best, and what are our unique delighters? You don't compete um, and win on must-haves. You just have to have those. So that's what we want to get clear on. And normally on the product path, we'd go down and say, okay, great, given that, what should our MVP be and what should our UX design be? But we're going to diverge now and instead say, what should our messaging be, basically, right? But we have it all starts from the same place. What's our value prop? Yeah? So if we want to talk about priorities and like considering like in a scenario that the costs are equal, would you rather go and try to make performance benefits higher than having a delighter, or sometimes delighter like two? It's unclear. It's a good question. It's unclear. I mean, I think in order to be differentiated, you you usually need to at least outperform on one benefit. That would be like the bare minimum. Um, the next, the next, what was very common is actually to outperform on one and have a unique delighter. That's a very powerful combination and. Um, we, it, earlier I shared the example of how Instagram did that, and I won't go into details about you. As soon as you start looking through that, you see that time and again, people that dominate, like, come into a category and take it over quickly, it's because they outperformed on a clear benefit that mattered to people, and they had a delighter. So for Instagram, the performance was they actually uploaded pictures more quickly than all the other people did at the time, because they just started uploading it right after you took it instead of waiting for you to push the upload button. And then the second thing was, they made your pictures look better, which was a delighter because of filters and because of the square aspect ratio. Your, your images didn't get shrunk and resized, basically. That's an example. Um, I, I do think, you know, theoretically, you could just have a delighter and be matched to performance, but that wouldn't be as defensible, I don't think. So, it's, it's, so anyway, that's how I would think about it. If you already have one performance benefit and, and the question was, hey, would it be better to extend that or to add a delighter? I, I don't think there's a set answer. It just depends on how much value each of those would create for people. Yeah. Dan, I'm up on your website and I'm trying to find the slides. Yeah. Where are they exactly? Uh, speaking page. It should be at the bottom of the speaking page. The bottom of the speaking page? Yeah. yeah. Okay, because, uh... Yeah, I'm happy at the end of the talk, I'm happy to point right to where okay, it's not there. But there should be, yeah. If you scroll down, there's there's like six slides yeah, here at the which bottom. One, which one is it? Messaging market fit. Got it. The heart, the heart puzzle piece. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. You got it. Uh, cool. So instead of going down the MVP path, we're going to talk about positioning. So what is positioning? Positioning is basically how you communicate to customers what your product is and how it's better than others. Right? That's what this is all about. And it specifies what category you're in, your target market, the core benefit, and why it's better, which is, again, your unique differentiator. And the cool thing about positioning is there's a template that you can just use. It's like an ad lib, basically, right? You, an ad lib or whatever. You just basically say, product name is a blank. For target market, that core benefit by unique differentiator, right? I put an example here of Google. Google product name is a search engine, the product category for everyone who uses the internet, so it's a big target market that helps people quickly find relevant information by having the best algorithms that deliver fast and measurable results. That would be an example, right? So that's that's what positioning is. So that's what we go from value prop to positioning, so that we can have when we go to create our messaging, it's compelling, basically, right? So positioning is kind of like the blueprint. Um, but it's not the actual like stuff you use. So I would this again is like internal speak. It's not feature speak, but it's still internal speak. So messaging is explicitly saying, okay, given what we're trying to accomplish, 
what words should we use? Right? It's kind of like problem-based, solution-based all over again. The objective is to convey this. What are the words that we should use? So messaging, again, it's not meant to be used. The positioning is an internal exercise, an internal document and phrases. It's not meant to be used as is externally. So messaging is specific to the words you use to convey your positioning. So here again, you can brainstorm, right? So you're doing this leap from, okay, that this is the benefit we want to say. Like, we want to say TurboTax saves you time. The positioning would be saves you time. We might not use those words saves you time. We might brainstorm a lot of different ways to say it, like, you know, in a New York minute, or faster than you can do this, or, you know, something like that. Might be ways that we would use it, right? So again, this is where the creativity comes in. You want to just, like, do brainstorming, divergent. Brainstorm a bunch of stuff, iterate, there's no judgment. You want to kind of be agile in how you do your messaging, right? And then you need to write some copy. Copy is just text, right? And, and you're going to end up needing different messages. This tagline is like the shortest. Then you want to have like, hey, if I had a sentence, here's what I would say. If I had a paragraph, here's what I would say. If I had a page, here's what I would say. Because you're in your marketing initiatives, you're going to need those different lengths. Um, and it's kind of like Mark Twain said, like, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. It's actually harder to write the shorter because you have to get the essence of it, right? So what are some principles of good messaging? The good messages are first and foremost easy to understand, right? And this is stuff you can test. Just like we test with prototypes, you can test your messages. I can just run it by you right now and say, you know, my, uh, my product is going to be the best cryptocurrency bank uh, in the world or something and see what you think about it, see what you say about it. Uh, the second thing is really important, it's just like the, the value prop is focused, one or two concepts max. If I try to jam in five different ideas into my positioning, you're not going to remember any of them. So really I would say one, but if you absolutely have to, two. The third one is short. You know, less is more, just like Mark Twain said. It's actually harder, and, but it's more memorable. If something gets too long, then just people don't remember it. Uh, clearly convey the benefits to consumers, so avoid the feature speak. We want to convey the benefits. It's great if it can sound differentiated, and the best is if it can be ownable from a branding standpoint, if it can be ownable by you, right? And the ultimate of that is, like, we call, we call facial tissues. What do we call facial tissues? Kleenex. Kleenex is actually one brand of facial tissue, but they've dominated it, right? In the old days, when you would make a photocopy, you would make a Xerox. Like it's the same thing, right? So that's what ownable means. It's like, oh my gosh, you own that space. There's nobody that, you know. Uh, here's a cartoon that kind of makes fun of this, where someone's trying to jam a lot of different things about the product. It's heart healthy and great tasting and all natural and single origin and aspirin. And the guy just says, hey, just because you can jam it all into one sentence doesn't mean it's a single-minded thing, right? So that's the idea. It's not about jamming things in one sentence. It's about the, the discipline to say, it's really the essence is about this, right? So the example I like to use to illustrate this is from the iPod. And uh, we'll actually look at the ads that they had and we'll decompose it using the concepts that I said, okay? So here's the ads. When they launched the iPod, you know, it was a big revolutionary product. You know, before that there were some MP3 players, but it was definitely like a great addition to the market. So here's what they had. Um, does the ad mention any features? Five megapixel. So many gigabytes. Say I've got this cool wheel. Not really any features, right? Does it actually and does it mention any benefits explicitly? Yeah. Yeah. What? Is that a benefit though? Yeah. Yeah. Not really. I mean, a benefit would be a verb. Remember what we said: save you time, save you money, help you enjoy music, hold more songs than anybody else. That I don't know, but so it's, anyway, they don't say it explicitly. That's why I put the word explicitly here. And that's a subtle nuance. They definitely are trying to convey a benefit, but the difference between positioning and benefits and messaging is the messaging evokes the benefit. You'll see this in a sec. So I would say 1,000 songs in your product actually sounds maybe more like a feature or solution speak than a benefit speak, but either way, they don't really say it's got this much gigabytes or this kind of thing, the features. I don't think they're talking about anything explicitly. Let's deconstruct it and see what's going on here, okay? So what do they say? It's 1,000 songs in your pocket. It meets the criteria. It's short, right? It's five words. That's pretty short. And it's an easy thing. You can imagine if you saw an ad, you had to explain it to your friend. Hey, 1,000 songs in your pocket, right? Let's break it down. The first part is 1,000 songs. What does that mean to you? What does that evoke when I say 1,000 songs? Variety. Variety, a lot. It's just a lot. It's like a large number, right? <laughs> that's all, it's like that's all it is. It's a clever way that by putting a number in, it just means like, that's a lot of freaking songs. Maybe even your whole library, right? Back then, remember? The whole big thing was, can I get my whole library on this thing? And all the MP3 players were smart, right? So it's a lot, that's right. 
So, but even again, this is this isn't feature yet either. So, what feature does that? What what functional attribute or feature is related to the number of songs you can put on a, a MP3 player? Storage, storage capacity, right? Yeah. This is where most people. That's how they would pitch this thing. That's how the acers of the world would pitch this thing. Hey, we have ten gigabytes. <laughs> no, ten gigabytes. No, large number of songs. That's good. Specific words we're going to use. A thousand songs, right? So that's how they did it. Um, and then the specific thing that they have is five gigabytes. I have five gigabytes of storage. That's how I could functionally describe what I've got. So you see the difference of how that those layers of what we're doing. They're very, Apple is very good at that. They don't just jump there though. They work their way up and they say, okay, if we wanted to, we wanted to message storage capacity and convey the benefits, what would be the most effective way to do that? And they, I'm sure they tested and iterated and they come up with outside. Let's go back to the in your pocket. What does that evoke? Small. Small. Portable. Portable. Lightweight. Lightweight. Mobile. Someone said, right? Can listen anywhere. Right. I think it's. I think it's portable. Small. Lightweight. If it sits in your pocket, by definition, gotta be small enough. You can take it with you, right? So that's that subtle ninja trick. That little. See how they did it in your pocket? They're they're managing to pack those concepts in, make you think of those. But they didn't say, we have a portable, small, light thing that you can listen to anywhere, right? They just said it that way. What does this relate to from a feature attribute, functional attribute of the phone? What are these, what would this term be? Size and weight, basically. I think size and weight secondarily, but size mainly, right? And then the specifics on the size are that, <laughs> right? So that's like, see how many layers are going up when they do the messaging that conveys all that stuff? So if they were like Acer and other companies, this is what the ad would look like. <laughs> <laughs> That is compelling or powerful, right? It's accurate, right? Very specific and precise, right? That would be if they did it at the feature level. If they did it at the benefit level, just to convey, it would be this, right? That's the difference between messaging and benefits and features. See that difference, right? And so that's the trick. There's that creative aspect. Yes? So what's the difference between this one and uh, your previous slide? Go back two slides, yeah, one before. Here you, you mentioned 1,000 songs, right? So wouldn't that give your competitors an opportunity? They can come up with like 1,050 and all of your um, potential customers would switch to your competitors. I don't think, well, a couple things. One is I don't think so. The whole point was, the whole differentiator was that they had the biggest capacity. There's a reason they had the biggest capacity compared to other people due to technology. The second thing is, I don't know if 50 would be enough for people to switch. In my other talk, I talk about how much better do you need to be and things like that. So I'm just thinking yeah. about uh, the anchoring effect. Like, uh, if you're anchoring 1,000, and if it is low from an industry standpoint, and yeah, but it wasn't low. But yeah, yeah, I mean, back then, saying 1,000 was almost like saying infinite. Yeah, exactly. So once exactly. somebody said yeah. infinite, yeah. 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 everybody was just a copy. I think it's a theoretical concern that doesn't apply in this case. And I just think, yeah, in general, you can get into a spec war if you do that. But they, so it's. It's unfortunate that they use a specific number because it uh, opens the door for what you're talking about, and in general you don't. But they decided because it basically meant well, you know, it's a large number of songs. It's like way more songs than I ever envisioned being able to put on an iPad back in the day. That's what it was, right? It's also an initial introduction. Yeah. You didn't really have a whole lot of competitors in this space. They were kind of the forerunners for the whole portable. Yeah, they were other ones. Where... The whole point was they were the big, they had the biggest capacity. I mean, that was part of it, right? Yeah, because I mean, the Diamond Rio had like what three albums worth. Yeah. So saying a thousand songs. It was crazy. Was like, yeah, they were. I had the they were other MP3 players, but they were limited in their capacity. They were very limited, and 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 they would all get pitched on how many megabytes, not how many songs. So even just talking to customers about songs instead of megabytes or gigabytes, it was just very consumer friendly to speak as well. Yeah, I think there's some categories or different types of tech products where where it is this numbers war that you're talking about, but actually that's the marketer's opportunity. I agree. Yeah. Rather than to like a transition, so, you know how many how many yeah. circuits are per inch or whatever, yeah. or how many yeah. how many transits, how many you know I'm not a hardware guy, so yeah. I'm I'm butchering. The no, I know what you mean. But but maybe you could say all the world's libraries read at once. Or yeah, something like exactly. That. that would be an example. Exactly. It says infinite speed and capacity is on this chip, yeah. and you don't have to put down a number. On yeah, it. And that's what happens. The whole solution space. The world typically devolves into solution space, and then you end up with feature checklists. And then everyone forgets about the customer and the benefits, and it's all just about, oh, they have a checkbox, and we don't have the checkbox, we're gonna add the checkbox. It's all this chasing in the solution space. Uh, and basically, the companies that are good, it's not because they're chasing their competition, it's because there are no customers better than anybody else, right? 
Can, can you clarify which of those messages are benefits and... Uh, yeah. And so benefits? this one, what is this one? Features. Features. This one is? Benefits. Benefits, benefits. But not messaging. Like it's just the pure, raw, internal benefits where we as a team say, we know that our iPad has larger capacity and small size. We can't think of anything better. Let's tell customers that. Like that's what that basically means. Another way you might say it is, is this. Let's you listen to the large number coming around the go. Right? This is kind of between the two. You're taking a stab at writing some messages, but it's longer, not as effective, and not as punchy as thousand songs in your pocket. But, but, but um, definition-wise, like concept-wise, this is identical to what they said. It's just different wording. Does that make sense? So now we're not only like at that level, but now it's like what words are we using at the messaging level? This is a wordier way to say it, right? So here's, a, again, to put it together, you got features, right, solution space, benefits, problem space, but then you've got this messaging layer on top, and that's where the creativity comes in. The funny thing is, so what did Apple message? They messaged storage capacity and size, but those weren't the only two things that it was better than all the other MP3 players. It actually was better than them on a lot of things. If you guys remember back then, what things did they not mention that it was better? Design. The design, yeah, the, the click wheel specifically was much easier to use. Those other ones were hard to use. They actually did the click wheel, made it really easy. Yep, what else? Audio quality. Audio quality. Audio quality? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, in the yeah, initial days, they didn't have an iTunes store, so the quality was whatever you had. I don't, I don't think. Later, they did. Yeah. What else? It looked cool with it. Look cool, yeah, aesthetics, definitely. Easy to upload and download. Yeah, auto sync. That was a pain in the butt. If you remember those old ones, you had to plug it in and you had to like drag song files in a folder. You know, it's just you plug it in and it did it, right? Yeah. Other stuff? They also started categorizing music pretty early. Okay, so cool. Okay, so good. You could listen to a themed set. Okay, yeah. cool. Expensive. Create your own playlist. Expensive, that's not a benefit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any messages? Showing off. Hey, look, I, I can afford it. Yeah. I'm not sending my kids to college, but I have an iPhone. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a couple other things. Firewire was another innovation, right? So USB only went so fast. You remember that Firewire they invented their own like protocol to do that? Uh, the other thing is, how long would those things last? Yeah. You played your MP3 player. This one was longer than everyone. It was 10 hours. They had a big battery in there, 10 hours of listening. There's one other thing that was in all the ads that we all drooled over, we all noticed subtly. Remember the ads with the silhouette people and they had the things coming down? Yeah, what color were they? Remember? We all know what color they were, right? So they made some cool earphones. It wasn't just about the iPod, the earphones, those were freaking, like, that was a big deal, right? That was the only thing you saw on the ad, really. So anyway, what's funny is they focused on the two things we talked about. They resisted the temptation to jam seven things that are all better than all the other guys. So they, trust me, they had a debate. Okay, which of these seven, you got two. Which two are we going to pick? And they picked those two out of, instead of all these things, right? And I think they made a good choice, but still they had to decide that. Here's the tagline that they had, right? Or the was it? <coughs> two sentences from Steve Jobs. With iPod, Apple's invented a whole new category of digital music player. Let's just put your entire music collection. See, that's... That's another way of saying a thousand songs. It's practically your entire music collection in your pocket and listen to it wherever you go. Yeah, so that, again, his messaging is on point with that, right? And so positioning, again, is that choosing what are we going to say? What are, which things are we going to highlight? Even if we're better on more than two, we can't say more than two, right? So here's the expanded version where benefit is like a filter for which benefits you're going to pass on to the messaging layer. Does that make sense? The cool thing is when you someone has done a good job at this, you end up with these slogans or taglines that evoke the benefits that you want. And when they meet the other criteria being short and clear, then you they become ownable and you know who the companies are. Like, let's just do this. Who says fly the friendly skies? You know, who says zoom zoom? Mazda. Who says finger looking good? Right. Happiest place on earth. Right. Let your fingers do the walking. This is a little outdated now. Yeah. Eat fresh. Subway. Subway. Well, well, fresh, but eat, eat fresh is Subway. Have it your way. Burr, right? They want to differentiate how McDonald's is one size fit all. So we said, hey, customization, right? Eat fresh, fresh, all this stuff, right? Happiest place on earth. Uh, keeps going and going and going. Yeah, they, uh, they put an extra and going in there just to promote it. That's the, so these are all examples, I think, of great messaging where it conveys the benefit and conveys how it's better than, than the other people, right? 
So when you come up with your ideas, you're going to brainstorm and come up with your best foot forward. You want to do just like you would test a prototype or a wireframe or a mock-up. You want to test it with users. It's the easiest thing to test messaging because it's just text, right? It's so easy. You just print it out on a piece of paper and say, hey, what, 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 what's your reaction to that? Like, oh, I don't get it. I don't get what that means, right? Um, and I don't have time to get into it, but I have a whole, in my book and all my online talks, I have some slides on how to conduct user testing and not lead the witness and ask questions. It really comes down to how you ask your questions and not leading them. Um, and then when you do research, there's two different types you can do. You can do qualitative and quantitative. Um, qualitative is when you actually, you know, you actually care what each person says. You're not going to talk to a thousand, so it's not going to be statistically significant, but you're going to like sit down with each user and really understand their reaction to the messaging and what benefits are important to them. So it's really about sitting down and getting to know what makes them tick. Who's the master of doing that on TV? Oprah. So that's the Oprah technique, is when you sit down one-on-one -on -one with your customers and really understand what they're all about. Quantitative is like, okay, I'm not going to actually talk to any one user. I'm going to try to aggregate a bunch of data across. Like, so if we did like some ad word test or some landing page conversion rate test, we could test out different messaging and see what's up. This is all about data, uh, statistics, analytics, logic, who's the master of that, Spock. So there's two very fundamentally different techniques of how we can test our messaging, right? We can test it quantitatively. You know, we may see that, hey, 20% uh, of people are clicking on this landing page where we're testing out our new messaging. That's good to know to our website. You have no idea why. Why are they clicking and why are the other people not clicking? So qualitative answers why is a good segue to this. Quant tells you what are people doing and how many. Qualitative tells why. So some people may prefer one or the other. They're both valuable. It's really not an either or. And you often need to go between the two. And what happens when you're testing basically is you're iterating. So in the problem space, you know, we're coming up with our best foot forward of what we think the best positioning and messaging is going to be. We head in a certain direction. We, we show, you know, we have a mock-up or some draft for our messaging. We show it to people. They give us feedback and say, oh, I like this, I don't like this. We go back and forth like that. Basically, that's how you do it, is by you can use your stimuli until you get to the point where people go, oh, yeah, I understand it. There's no questions, and they like it basically right. Um, as far as quantitative testing you can do for messaging, you can do ads are a great way to do little tests, right, just you know, a few hundred bucks or even less, and try out five different ways. You know, if you're like, hey, okay, we want to convey that the iPod is really small. Well, maybe we try out fits in your pocket. Maybe we try out, you know, just two inches long. We try out five different ways, and we see what resonates with people, right? That would be one way to do that. Uh, landing pages, you know, you can create a landing page and check out differential conversion rates between the different landing pages. Um, emails are an important part of marketing, too. See what kind of response book through rate you get. There's a bunch of tools to let you do A-B testing, optimize the unbalance, all those. Um, so it's pretty easy these days. And when you run one of those tools, You'll run like a bunch of different combinations and then it'll give you an output something like this where it'll show you, you know, what the top performers are, what the confidence intervals are. So like these are clearly not good. These two are the best ones and you can kind of see uh, and figure it out. And again, this is iterative. So we're going through this hypothesized design test learn loop. So we're hypothesizing that saying thousand songs in your pocket is a good way to say it or the best way to say it. And we go out and we test and we try to confirm that basically. And when we do this, what's going on is, you know, we're basically designing and testing in the solution space and then learning in the problem space and iterating through that loop. Um, cool. So just to summarize again, uh, avoid feature speak. Get clear on who your target market is. Understand which benefits they care about and use that Kano model to get clear on your value prop and your positioning, right? And then we're going to make the leap to messaging, right, from there. So brainstorm a bunch of stuff, write copy, test it, uh, learn, iterate, and improve. And I mentioned that I run a monthly meetup. Um, it's meetup.com slash lean hyphen product. If you want to come, the next one, we have it once a month. I've been doing it for four years. We have 6,500 uh, members. I invite top speakers in product management and UX design. Uh, the next one we have is on the 19th. It's at Intuit headquarters in Mountain View. And she, Tracy, does a great job of explaining design for non-designers. And I think that's a good skill for PMs to have. And she wrote this really good book for Hello Love Design. So anyway. The other thing I want to mention is, I mentioned I'm a PM consultant. Uh, for seven years, it was just me. And recently, I've added some people to my team. So I'm at the VP level helping people out. I have director and SPM level people. So if you or your company is interested or think you might want help, please ping me. Uh, and then Brendan wanted me to mention uh, that you know they're doing these surveys on the talk. So if you want to go and leave feedback on the talk, that would be great. And with that, we've got like about five minutes for questions more with the break. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And I will tweet, I'll check the Twitter uh, during the break and I'll, uh, I'll let, who, let the person know who won the book. And I'm happy to connect on LinkedIn with you guys. So I'm happy to answer any, any other questions that we didn't cover yet. Just want, just want to clarify, yeah. you said avoid feature speak, but the example you gave, the iPod, is a feature message, right? No? What was the message? 
All you said was uh, storage capacity and. All right, but what did they actually put in the ad? Right. What was the other part? Second half. <laughs> yeah, see, it's so memorable. Yeah, so what so they message? That's considered benefit. That's messaging. Well, let me go back to that's cool. Let me go back here. All right. I didn't show the two next to each other, but this. So, saying it's five gigabytes is features. Mm -hmm. Saying it's got a large storage capacity is a benefit. And then they actually had a lot of other things that they were better on. We talked about all seven things that they were better on. Positioning was, hey, we're going to focus on those two, and then we're going to actually come up with messaging. So the messaging, so that, that's like, this. let me go back to this slide. This, if I could put these two slides next to each other, I think it would make it clearer, but right, these are the different layers. So this would be feature speak, right? This would be the detailed. This is like product attributes. These are benefits kind of more. And then this is messaging. That's the idea. So the key takeaway is, one, don't focus on solutions. Focus on the problem. Focus on benefits. Start with benefits. But when it comes to messaging, you have to go an extra layer, two layers. One, positioning. If you have multiple benefits, you could message. You need to pick no more than two. And then for those two, no more than two, you need to come up with what are the specific words that evoke those benefits versus literally saying the benefits. Does that make sense? That's the idea. So yeah, so they, again, they, this is what they said, which is at the messaging layer. This is what it would be at the feature layer would be this version. This layer would be a benefits one, right? Uh, this is kind of more attributes, and this would be like a benefit, another way to do the benefits of this. So anyway, that's the difference between those two points. Does that help yeah. clarify? Cool, yeah. <coughs> Yeah. In your in your example, it's a very consumer oriented company. Uh -huh. right? um, some of us work in B two B. His question: It can be very confusing in B two B. Features, benefits, messaging. I think it's the same thing. I think you got to get clear. I think that just people fall into that trap more where they compare feature checklists, and the, you know, it's easy to fall into the trap of competing on specs. You know, so my question yeah. was this. Here's my question. Yeah. It's a good test of whether you're not there yet, right, in terms of the ultimate messaging. Yeah. That it is it is, is, is what I have really sounding very consumer oriented, right? I don't think it has to sound consumer. I mean, basically, I think, like, let me just pick an example. I mean, it's like what your sales team is telling to the, it's like, instead of it being on an ad, it's like what your sales team, how your sales team is pitching your product. It better be focused, grounded in benefits and how you're outperforming the other people, right? From a benefit standpoint. And then the messaging is just as a way to simplify it and make it easier. But your best salespeople, I bet you could reverse engineer. Say you've got 100 salespeople selling your, your enterprise product. The top five salespeople, I bet they've got these pat phrases that they don't, they're not consumerish, but they're at the same level of performance as thousand songs in your pocket. You know what I mean? Where they're, they've evolved and iterated this words that that evokes the right response. Is there some way that you can describe that? Because there are salespeople who look up easy. Right, no, sure. It's everyone, again, everyone devolves to the solution space. In a B2B context, are you saying it's more human, more relatable? Is yeah. It more personal? Uh, well, well, I just, no, I think, mm, I think it's, I think it's more meaningful. I think it's, one is it's more meaningful. If I okay. tell you it's five gigabytes, now, part of it is you may have a very informed technical buyer. In those cases, then you are just competing on spec. But again, it's important to get really clear on which ones are we outperforming on, and then actually just you know saying it as opposed to just having a checklist, right? Like saying, we have the fastest network speed. Yes, the number is 20, and yes, the other guys are 18, but rather than just tell you 20 and let you figure it out, we're going to tell you that we are 20% faster than everybody else. You know what I mean? Like it's that. That's the way. So it's not an either or. Or all the speed you would ever need. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Is yeah. that to be memorable? <clears throat> ideally, yeah. Remember there was, a, there was a characteristic, yeah. I think ideally it would. Yeah. So it's like saying, you know, if you have a product that has a backup. Yeah. And you can say you can do daily backups mm -hmm. versus now you're doing every few days. Mm -hmm. So that's the benefit. Yeah, I would say something like backup whenever you want or backup as frequently as you want or backup as much as you want. Or, and then if I did five whys, and, and I said to a consumer, why is backup important? Why is backup important? So you, lose data, then so you don't lose data. Well, that's an even better way to say it. Like, never lose your data or something. Or like, you never lose your work because we're backing up every second. Every millisecond, we're backing it up or something. You know what I mean? That would be a way. But, but again, the whole point is the money 
thing I care about is that if something happens, I'm going to be able to recover my data. And then the next question is, can I recover it quickly or not? Like, there's a, there's a whole other attribute you could say, like, hey, you can recover it and anyway. So that's the enterprise messaging. Yeah, yeah, but I think it's still the same discipline. It's not that it's consumerish. It's that it's it means something to the people. It conveys the benefit to the person. It's memorable. It's concise. The other thing is just you know think about is it they can tell it to someone else. That'd be great if it's so short and memorable that they tell it to their colleague in the next BU. And then they give you a call and say, hey, we want to buy that too because I got the tagline from this guy. He's not going to say, oh, yeah, they got 20 gigabits per second over there, man. That's great. You got to buy that. Like, you know, they might. But that's a very, there is a specific subcase of a very technically savvy buyer who's just, it's all, but it's performance. It's just, it's quantified with numbers, but it's performance based. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I noticed that since validating with the Apple messaging or the YouTube, messaging is that they didn't go so high up that was like more yeah water yeah we're going to make your life it, better yeah, right yeah it made it very relatable mm -hmm. to that demographic yep. so right. i love that because it was like more songs that you can carry around would have said the same thing or like gotten really esoteric and like you know um now you're in zen something blah, blah. yeah right yeah, so yeah they made it like very relatable like thousand songs in my pocket yeah. yes that's a call to action yeah you're right, you can go too high level and it's watered down, it doesn't mean anything. This, how many buzzwords, that's the other way the marketing departments go. We have the most highly performance, scalable network infrastructure architecture. It's just a bunch of buzzword baloney. <laughs> and everyone's saying the same thing, so it's like, you know what I mean? So it's like cutting through the noise, with, so I agree, so you can go too vague or too you know, high like level. really listening when they were looking at the potential market customers mm -hmm. in like 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on that note, like one of the biggest uh, Apple's campaign was Think Different. Mm -hmm. It was like in 1985 around that time. So is that too abstract for uh, like an Apple I think it's a different goal though. So that one is funny because I recently was discussing that. It's not as clear as this, right? So it's like, what the heck? That's that's very removed. And I think what they were just trying to say is is that contrasting PCs versus Macs kind of thing. You know it's what like I mean? It's like a company it's, branding. What's that? Company it's branding. like, yeah, it's more corporate branding, company branding, but it basically is just like, hey, it's kind of like goes back to the 1984 ad, if you think about it, like, it's just like, hey, this is like cookie cutter, everyone's using the same thing, but you're special, like, you think different, you're special, so we're going to, you know, if you're special, then you, if you're think different, you should, I, it's kind of abstract. These happen all the time, they're Super Bowl commercials, you scratch your head afterwards, you're like, what was that, or, Even with think yeah. different, if you go back to that time, with the Chinese <coughs> ideas and whatever, the whole, I think what they found out with the customers was that they were not able to use the systems that they wanted to, and they were catered into that demographic. So the original Mac users were considered like the best results because they wanted to be the best. I think they're riding on that. Yeah, that's an yeah. There are definitely examples of brand advertising, brand level messages, which go higher than a particular product. So I'm, I wasn't trying to go there, but they're definitely. There are some of those examples out there for sure, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you guys. You. Thank you. Yeah.